Thank you all so much. It is an honor to be here um, and to be able to speak about Poland. I speak about it not as a historian, right? There are probably technical details in the story that I'm going to tell that you're going to fact check and say, actually, that was seven months sooner than what you said, Father. And you know what? That's okay. I'm not a historian, but I am a Pole. I'm a Polish citizen through uh, my parents who immigrated the year before uh, I came, or before I came, before I was born. And it's been an interesting experience for me growing up that I think some of you maybe have been able to share. And that's growing up in between, thank you so much. No, that's all right. Uh, that is growing up straddling two cultures. Right, having Polish be what's spoken at home and then English be what's spoken at school. Having this mix of, okay, what am I? Am I Polish? Am I American? Am I Polish American? Am I American Polish? But in that, it gave me an appreciation both for this culture in which I was raised, but also the gift that my parents gave me in the culture from which they came. So when I speak, about Poland, I speak about it as something personal. And it is one of the histories that is most personal, actually, out of any country. Because in, in Poland, what you remember is that every country is not just the borders of the land where the people reside, and its history is not just a set of dates when they had this battle or that battle. But rather, every culture, every country, seems to have a real soul. It seems to have um, this something to it that can endure even when the borders change. Even when, as we'll get to in the story of Poland, the borders are completely erased and the country's wiped off the face of the globe. And yet it endures. And so that's part of what I want to reflect on today. As we go through the history, that any country is more than just the geography and the dates of what happened when. There is a story that has formed a character in the people, and that that's something to be celebrated. Because the more that we know about where we came from, the more we can know about ourselves. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? To be able to honestly look at the culture that formed me helps me to see what might be some of my biases, but might, what might also be some of my strengths. And so, without further ado, we go into Polish history. Actually, no, one more ado. <laughs> so, one further ado. And that is, Poland, for over the last millennium, has been a Catholic Christian country. But because of that, it has allowed Poland to have a lens through which to look at its own history and to understand itself. And as you see, as we sketch this history of this country, that a lot of Polish thinkers over the years, especially the most difficult years, started seeing in their own history the history of two different figures, ancient Israel and Jesus Christ, right? As they reflect on the Old and New Testaments of sacred scripture, they see how it echoes in their lives. And in fact, in just a reading of scripture, I'm gonna talk about scripture a bit, I'm a priest, I don't know if you know that. Um, but in it, you see that all that Israel was called to be, in the New Testament, Jesus is presented as the fulfillment of that. And the Polish people for, uh, hello, the Germans coming in late. That's part of Polish history. Welcome here. That's right. Um, so Polish thinkers for over a, uh, a thousand years of reflecting on this faith were able to see how it resonates in their own lives. So that is the last ado, and now we can get into the story. And the story begins, as almost every culture does, with a legend. Right? We cultures, 
we're basically just extended families. And just as families have stories that get embellished over time, like, oh man, Uncle Joe, he, got, he caught a fish this one time, there's this great story about it, it was this big, and the next generation, this fish was this big. And for the next generation, that fish was enormous. It was basically a whale. Uncle Joe caught a whale. <laughs> right? Well, in cultures, legends grow up in a similar way, and they're almost always trying to explain how or why are we here and not there. Why do we look this way, but they look that way? Why are we friends with these people, but not friends with those people? And of course, legends can be uh, used and abused in various ways. We're uh, kind of looking at that in our own cultural narrative right now. But the founding legend of the Slavic people has to do with three brothers. Pop quiz. Does anybody know what these brothers were called? What their names were? No Slavs out there? Actually, that could be my first question. Anybody here have Polish origin? There we go. Okay. So this is our family history, apparently. <laughs> so it started with three brothers, Lech, Trek, and Rus. And the three of them were out on a hunting expedition. And Rus, he saw this land near where now like Crimea is. And he says, you know what? I kind of like this. has some, some rivers here, some water. I, I like this area. I'm going to stay and I'm going to hunt here. Well, the other two brothers are like, no, nah, no, nah, we got to keep going west. And so they keep going west. And Trek, he sees these mountains and he says, I really like these mountains. This is where I'm going to stay. I'm going to hunt here. And Lech, he thinks, I mean, that's good. I like your mountains there, but I really think that I should go north. And then he spots this white eagle. And he says, oh, i got to follow this eagle. So he keeps going north, follows this eagle, and then finally the eagle rests on a tree, and it's right as the sun is setting, the sky is blazoned red, and he sees white eagle against a red backdrop of a sky, and he says, this is where I will stay. And that's how we get the Polish flag. Where in the Polish flag we have emblazoned, we have white over red, but typically in the very center there's also a white eagle there. And so that is the, the founding story of the, these three Slavic nations. Rus, Russia, Czech, 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 uh, Czech Republic, and then Lech, who was the founder of the Slavic tribes that became Poland. That's the legend. And then the Slavic people live there in various tribes that sometimes were peaceful, sometimes less, but, you know, they coexist there for the first millennium of uh, AD, right? They are there together, and in the 900s, one of these Slavic tribes, the Polans, they end up growing and growing a little bit more and growing a little bit more, right? They realize there's strength in being united, and so they try to unite all of these, um, all of these uh, Slavic tribes that are in the, the middle part of what you see there is the modern outline of Poland. He unite, they unite together under King Mieszko I. He's an important figure. So King Mieszko I, he unites a lot of these tribes and they start growing as a power, growing more and more powerful, but then from the West come, who was it that came in late today? Germans. The Germans. <laughs> no, you were right on time. It just happened to be that the... It's a tough campus to navigate sometimes. I get it. But the Germans, it was our dear friend Otto I, who in uh, 955 comes knocking. And at this point, all of the people in these Slavic tribes are... Uh, various forms of uh, pagan beliefs, usually like naturalistic, thinking a little bit about like ancestors that have come before, but also various kind of spirits of um, uh, that you can see in nature. So a very common type of pagan belief in that time. They don't have one organized religion that all of they, them have, but more or less similar beliefs. Well, Otto and his pals, they've been Christian for a while. 
So he comes knocking and he wants control over where Neshko lives. Neshko thinks, hmm, I can fight him or I can join him. And he decides, you know, this Christianity thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. And in those days where your leader went, you went in terms of belief. And so when he was baptized, the whole country officially became Christian as well. So he was baptized, and then almost all of the people there were baptized as well. Now, things don't just change overnight in the actual belief and the existence of people. Right? It, take, it took decades for them to actually adopt the, the teachings and the practices of Christianity, but officially, in 966, Mieszko I converts, and Poland becomes, or what would become Poland, those tribes become Christian. Mieszko, though, he wasn't exactly a just sit down and listen to what Otto's going to say type of Christian. He said, okay, we're brothers now in Christianity. Still, you're not getting my land. And so, Mieszko ended up pushing back against Otto a little bit. But what you'll notice all throughout Poland's history, and it starts right here, is that it's vulnerable to attack from pretty much every side. There's no good geographical, okay, we can back up against these mountains and we'll be all right. People won't cross from the other side. No. From 360 degrees, we have neighbors, and our neighbors are not always nice. We're not always nice to them either. Welcome to the human family. <laughs> but here, with Mieszko, he starts uniting the tribes so that they can stand a chance against the more powerful um, neighbors. In 972, the neighbors from up north, the Teutonic Knights, Anybody heard of them? Okay, can you tell me about them? Who were they? Those were uh, Germans. Um, they were very proud and strong and brave, and they were very important in Germany mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah, very good. And by the way, nothing against the Germans. I'm a quarter German too, so. <laughs> We're cousins, it's okay. Uh, uh, but the Teutonic Knights, they were a crusading order. So their, their big thing was, uh, we want to spread Christianity by good means and not so good means. Uh, but they were very passionate and rather powerful as a military force. And they settled in the lands around the Baltic, where currently it's red, uh, right there by the sea. Um, that's where the Teutonic Knights were. And they were one of the first um, kind of difficulties for the Polish people. So Poland has to deal with that threat in the north. And then to the west, Otto says, hey, we're the bigger, more powerful people. Uh, Y'all got to bow down to us. And so then Poland has to also stave off a uh, potential invasion from the west, from Otto. What's incredible about Mieszko is that he shouldn't have won any of these battles, and yet he did. And so there is that beginning of Polish pride of like, okay, even when we're outnumbered, we could do something here. Mieszko dies in 992, and his son Bolesław succeeds him. Don't worry, we won't be going into this much detail for the whole thing. This is just setting up the scene for what's to follow. Well, when Bolesław is there, at the, the very beginning of the turn of the millennium, that's when the first plan to attack Poland from all sides comes together. The successor of Otto, or one of the successors, was Henry II. And by then, it's the Holy Roman Empire that uh, is, I mean, modern day Germany and then some, decides Poland can be attacked from all sides. We can just squeeze it into submission. And so decides to get the Slavic tribes and the Czech forces to go from the east and from the south, Holy Roman Empire from the west. There we go. And he says, okay, we are going to take Poland off of the map. 
this is going to be a theme. Boleslav, though, ends up flipping the scenario on the Holy Roman Empire, uh, on uh, Henry II, through some military conquest, ends up getting the other two to side with him, and uh, ends up gaining, I mean, not control over the Holy Roman Emperor, but getting him off of his back temporarily. So you'll see here, this is the beginning of two themes. One, all of Poland's neighbors coming together to say, let's get rid of Poland. Two, Poland stubbornly saying, that's not going to happen. In 1025, Bolesław dies. Mieszko II, sadly, who succeeds him, is not quite who his grandfather was. Kind of a weak ruler by comparison. His brothers take the crown from him. Uh, in just a few years after that, then uh, in 1034, he finally gets it back and then he dies. Why do I mention that? Family strife seems to also be a Polish tradition, but I think that's in every culture. And we've seen in the last like 15, 20 years, the shows that we watch reflect that. We love these historical dramas of intrigue and betrayal and all that. That's been part of the human makeup, I think, in every single culture all throughout time. That we've been dealing with, what does it mean to be loyal? How badly does betrayal sting? What is that part of me that wants to just manipulate and wants to be um, kind of power grabbing? But then what is the part of me that just wants to live in peace? It's a fascinating thing to reflect upon in our own hearts, but you see it play out in the history of Poland as well. We keep moving forward, and in 1050, we have this guy named Kashmir the Restorer. And he's the one that finally, as his name would suggest, what do you think he does? He restores, exactly. So he gets uh, a sense of order back. After a lot of this infighting, he says, listen, if we are going to stand a chance against all of our powerful neighbors, We've got to be united. So he restores order to things, but then, as humans tend to do, he dies. And after that, we have some kings that were not quite at the level of Kashmir the Great, or Kashmir the Restorer in this case. Um, and you see a division in the country from this neat, united thing into a bunch of separate duchies again. And so there's this constant um, shifting. This is why I wanted the shifting map to be up there on replay as you were coming in. Because you see that Poland's shape and form just changes over the centuries like crazy. And it's in that that it's kind of similar also to the history of Israel. Right? When you read through the Old Testament, and this is why Polish thinkers often made this connection, that in Israel you would have a great king and then a terrible king. And a great king and then a terrible king. And that cycle would continue. Similarly in Poland. 1241, so now we are... Uh, no, no, I shouldn't skip over that. Right? We just left 1050. Over the next... 200 years, what happened in Poland is they were starting to get more and more stable. And during that time, people started coming to Poland from all over. Because there were relatively tolerant laws. A lot of, actually, um, the Jewish peoples all throughout the rest of Europe, who were dealing at times with, with pretty heavy persecution, would come to Poland because Poland kind of had an understanding of, like, you're being picked on, we get picked on too. Let's band together. And so in this, um, uh, the, this period, you saw a lot of people kind of flocking to Poland and making it a much more diverse place than you would ever think just looking at Poland right now. But that's what it was. Some were invited, others were not. Some of the not invited ones were in 1241 when the Mongols started coming in. Now, the Mongols, as you may know, quick pop quiz, who were the Mongols? The Mongolian Empire. The Mongolian Empire, excellent. And tell me something about them. Um, 
believe it started under Ogadai, the invasion of Poland, and then it stopped being an invasion when Ogadai died, and they all had to go back to Boda Nu Khan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe they are the big threat in Mulan, am I correct? I believe it's Attila the Hun. <laughs> That's Attila the Hun. Well, oh, so it was the Huns, not the Mongols. Ah, got that one wrong. Okay, then that image is not going to work for you. These are not the same people as there. But yeah, so the Mongols, they were terrifying to Europe because they were incredibly quick and effective in whenever they came to take over a place. Well, Poland, as you can tell in the, the cosmic joke that was played on them and their geography, they are the buffer between east and west. And so when the Mongols from the east are coming, one of the first places that's going to be hit is Poland. And here we have some famous battles, raids, but what's interesting is that the Mongols couldn't quite penetrate that much further in, just because the Poles, even if we're not the strongest, even if we're not the smartest, we're pretty stubborn, and so we'll at least put up a fight. All throughout the 1200s, you have still um, various different um, Mongol attempts to come in, go back, come in, go back. By the 1300s, we've got a Czech invasion from the other side. Um, this is a period where we are starting to feel just how much, just how difficult our geographical position is. And so we're getting attacked from all sides. And we might think, life is terrible. Why did we choose to live here? Come on, Lex, stop following eagles because you picked the wrong spot. And then finally in the 1300s, we catch a few breaks. Who can tell me what happened in 1333 in Europe? In much of Europe, I should say. Is that the rat invasion? The rat invasion? Yes, the fleas. <laughs> the, oh, that was a little bit later, but yes. Um, now, in 1333, you had what they called a mini ice age. It was just crazy cold temperature that ruined the crops of so many uh, different countries in Europe, and Poland was actually spared. So for once, they were looking around like, wait, wait, we did better than the other countries this time? Like, this is great. We can finally breathe freely. And so they had that, that one good year when everybody else had a bad year, and that helped them to bounce back a little bit from this uh, century of attacks. After that, 15 years later, in 1348, what happened then in Europe? The Black Plague. And there too, even though, I mean, you've heard about it, you've read about it, it devastated so many communities all throughout Europe. Poland actually didn't fare nearly as badly. I don't know, maybe we had more cats and less rats or something like that, but for some reason, Poland did not fare as badly. So those were two things that propelled them into this next period, that they weren't as devastated by that as some of the other countries. During that time, uh, there was another wave of Jewish immigration into Poland because the situation for them in a lot of these other countries was getting worse and worse. I mean, sadly, even in some countries, we always want to find a scapegoat, right? When there's a problem, I want to blame someone else. Never did I lose it. No, it lost itself. That's what I love about Spanish reflexive. <laughs> it's like, I didn't lose my shoe. My shoes, they lost themselves. <laughs> um, but we have that kind of ingrained that it's the thing's fault. It's another person's fault. And so the Jews were often scapegoated, even for things completely beyond their control. There are even some people who would maybe blame things like the plague on the Jewish people. And so they ended up moving from place to place to place. And in Poland, things weren't perfect, but at least they were better. And so in the 1300s, you had a lot of uh, Jewish immigration into Poland. And then comes Kashmir the Great. Not just Kashmir the Restorer, but building upon having been spared in some of the worst things that happened around Europe, Poland was able to enter into um, something close to its golden age. We had uh, cultural and territorial growth under Kashmir the Great. 
but he did what humans tend to do. He died. Left his kingdom to his nephew, the king of Hungary. But then he died too. And we were thinking, okay, once again, this spells the end of Poland. But when he died, he left his kingdoms to his daughters. And his daughter, Jadwiga, Hedwig, who you may remember that name from Harry Potter, right? Before that, before she was an owl, she was a queen of Poland. <laughs> but actually, she wasn't named queen. This is a funny thing that I've never received an adequate explanation for. She was named king of Poland rather than queen. Interesting enough, I think it was in order to secure that she is, in fact, the ruler. Um, in those times, perhaps a king, king carried more weight than queen. But in any case, at a young age, she is made the king of Poland. And she has the choice of two suitors, one down in Austria and one in Lithuania. Now, Lithuania had become this pretty big force in Eastern Europe at this time. And she chooses Lithuania. And in the marriage between Hedwig and Jagiello, we have the Polish-Lithuanian Union that starts there and becomes a force to be reckoned with for the next few centuries. We have the Teutonic Knights. Uh, oh, actually, this is where they come in more. Sorry, not a historian. So this is when some of the more important battles against the Teutonic Knights happen, and this is when, finally, the Polish-Lithuanian Union is strong enough to just defeat them. Uh, at the Battle of Grunwald, that happens in 1410. And this is one of those huge battles in the Polish mind. The Battle of Grunwald is a huge one. Uh, the Battle at Vienna is a huge one. The Battle... Um, against the Bolsheviks in Warsaw, that's a huge one. These are some of our cultural moments that they're touchstones for us of who are we? We are the people that did this. And so this first one was against those who, even though they shared our faith, had a vastly different way of living it out and kept on coming into Polish and Lithuanian land and really essentially just raiding and pillaging. They would go into, by this time, some of the lofty ideals from the beginning of the order had been forgotten by many of them. And so Lithuania at this time was still a bit more pagan than Poland, that it had been Christian for uh, a few centuries now. And so under that excuse of like, oh, we've got to Christianize those pagans over there, the knights would go into Lithuanian land. Well, finally, now that there was the union, they were able to stop that. But this is when Poland defined itself as this is the way that we will live out the Christian faith. Not by going into another country and forcing them into it by the sword, but rather by living it out ourselves. And in the course of living it out ourselves, even inviting those who maybe don't share the faith to live with us in peace, which what was, is what was happening in uh, those initial Jewish immigrations. So, Battle of Grunwald, that's when our real golden age starts. During that time, we have this Polish parliament system that gets put into place. And what's interesting is that it's actually similar in terms of the percentage of people that had a vote as to who the ruler would be. It's similar to ancient Athens and the first democracies. You had what was called the Schlachta, that was the noble class, and that was 10% of Poland's population, and they were the ones who made decisions over who would eventually be the king. It was this convoluted, super idealistic, kind of cool, but ultimately untenable system of government, where they wanted as many people to have a say. Around them, though, they had quick-acting monarchies, that yes, you rose and fell based on uh, how good your king was, but at least you can act quickly. Here, when everybody is at the discussion table, everybody can veto, unfortunately nothing got done. So even though culturally this was a great time for Poland, politically it was a time that would not last. In the 1560s and 1590s, we have more pressure. 
from a lot of the different countries all around. The Swedes start attacking from the north. We've got the Russians from the east. You got the Holy, or not the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, I think still. Uh, this time you've got um, other Western Europeans coming in from the west and from the south. And at that point there was what was called the deluge. What, what is a deluge? Heavy downpour. Heavy downpour. Well, that is what it felt like to Poland. Because at that time, you had um, various forces from all sides coming in on Poland. And it was another one of those periods of like, oh, man, can't we all just get along? Why do you? Okay, yep, you're attacking from every single side. This is terrible again. So you'll see that same dynamic that I explained earlier of relative peace and then getting it from all sides, and then relative peace and then being attacked from all sides, that, that continues pretty much every other century with Poland. But a very important thing happened in 1683. So after the 1600s had, were filled with so many different battles where uh, Sweden was coming in, uh, Russia, the Tatars, who had settled in the southern part of Poland, they wanted basically independence from Poland and kept on uh, fighting Poland from the south. Uh, that added to that whole mix were the Turks. Now, who can tell me what the Turks were or what they represented to Europe at that time? The Ottoman Empire. And what do empires like to do? Oh, they like to spread. They like to conquer. Right? And every country has a little bit of that in them of like, oh, if that land's free, I'll take it. Uh, but the Ottoman Empire was a force to be reckoned with. And Europe was terrified. Because they weren't, it looked like they were not going to be stopped. And it looked like Vienna was that crucial point that if they get Vienna, they're going to keep going and Christendom's going to be gone. Now we have to remember, now we live in a more secular age where religion is for some people very important, but for many it's just this kind of vestige of, oh, okay, yeah, that's how some people choose to live. <clears throat> in this time, religion was such an important part of your identity that to think that these people who shared, who had different beliefs than us were going to come in was like a total shift of who I am is going to be essentially changed here. And so the Battle of Vienna was a hugely important thing for the just European ideals and for the identity of the people who lived in Europe. At that time, a Polish king was chosen to lead the international army that had gathered against the Turks in 1683. Anybody know what his name was? That's right, Jan Sobieski. I could tell you were all thinking it. <laughs> what, uh, what a fun little fact. This is, I guess, what we do if we like someone in Poland. They named the vodka after him. So at my, sis at my sister's wedding in Poland, I remember on every table there was a bottle of Sobieski. And I was like, ah, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, but King Sobieski ends up uniting the troops, and as their marching orders, or as, as a, a cadence, what he ended up having them say, because they were coming from all sorts of different countries, different languages, they had different training. What was it that united them? Was that they all shared a Christian faith, and their language that they could all unite under they actually prayed the Hail Mary in Latin to be able to be in the same cadence uh, as they were um, getting together to be able to fight the Turks. They were outnumbered, they shouldn't have won, and yet they did. And in that moment, there's this beautiful tapestry actually in the Vatican archives that I was able to see one time. Uh, and it just shows this, this great victory, and right underneath it is this... Um, letter from King Sobieski to the Pope at the time, telling him about the battle. And do you all remember what Julius Caesar said following um, one of his 
victorious battles. It was, I came, I came, I saw, I conquered. Yeah, three, not four. Uh, when Jan Sobieski starts his letter, which is also in Latin, he says, I came, I saw, God conquered. No. It was in that, it was in that, that, that kind of line of, this is how deeply embedded religion was uh, for these people. They saw this as not just a military victory, but as this moment of reclaiming their, or defending their cultural identity. And they really saw this as something that their faith had a deep part in. In 1683, that happens. Jan Sobieski goes back to Poland and everything is better from there on out. This is the end of the story, right? Now, the story continues in the similar dynamic. In 1772, Poland's neighbors are strong and Poland is weak. And so all of the neighbors, they say, you know what? All of us want all of Poland, but we're not gonna get that. How about all of us get part of Poland? Wouldn't that be great? And so they do. And that's what we have, the first partition of Poland. And so, well, that's not Poland anymore, but if you imagine the Greyhound is Poland, uh, one of the countries takes the nose, the other one the ear, and the other one a bit of the neck. And that's the first partition. And they say, okay, this is good, we all get a little bit more, and Poland gets a little bit less. And that's good for all of us, because, you know, they're stubborn, they tend to rebel, let's just take some of their land and their people. Well, Poland in 1791 establishes a new constitution with a lot of uh, reforms. It's that time of constitution writing, right? The second part of the 18th century. And they have a lot of the ideals that you see in the Constitution of the United States of America, in the French Constitution. It's a similar way of thinking. And Catherine the Great doesn't like that all that much in Russia, and so she ends up talking to the other powerful neighbors and says, you know, Poland, yeah, the country we kind of took bits out of, let's just take the rest. Like, what are they going to do? And so that's what they did. And in 1793, we have the second partition. And, and this is the point that I wanted to get to, is that at this point in 1793, Poland officially doesn't exist. If you look at a map of 1793, four, five, anything in that time period, there's no Poland. And here we get to that first point that I made, that a country is more than its borders, that its history is more than just the important dates, but that to know a country, you have to learn its soul. And Poland has a stubborn soul. During this time that they were wiped off the map, they started getting this romantic patriotism that was unmatched in their prior history. It came them to them having the absolute worst scenario of no longer existing for them to remember who they are. That it's more than the land, but that it's a character trait of the people. Here too, we get back to the connection with ancient Israel. One of the defining episodes in Israel's history was the exile. When they were taken forcibly from their land and taken to Babylon, that's when some of the most beautiful, heartfelt writings of the Old Testament came from, when Israel had to reckon with, we had forgotten who we were. And now we want to remember who we are. So during that time of no official Poland, the spirit of Poland was strengthened. The people who were spread across three different countries then we're writing poetry, we're writing songs, we're uh, trying to keep alive a Polish spirit if there ever was such a thing. In 1807, they get a glimmer of hope. Because that, who was the little guy who conquered Europe for a while? Napoleon. Napoleon. Apparently it wasn't as little as we make it out to be. A lot of that's propaganda, but we'll still call him the little guy. Uh, no, I don't want to spread that. The normally sized man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who had conquered much of your, well, Napoleon. Love him or hate him? For a little while, he was super effective. And one of the things that he was effective at was looking at, like, where can I get support from a people that feels like they have been downtrodden? 
Poland. And so he establishes, during the little bit of time that he had power, uh, the Duchy of Warsaw. And so finally, Poland has, has something. It has a glimmer of hope again. But then, of course, Napoleon tried to do what nobody but the Mongols can do. Tried to invade Russia. Don't invade Russia. It just doesn't work. Uh, and so Napoleon <coughs> ends up being defeated. And the Duchy of Warsaw is no longer. But that gave Polish people a little bit of hope. We might have a country again. In 1815, Poland's under the control of Russia. 1863, Polish revolt against Russia, but they're defeated. And during that time, for that, uh, those 1800s, after Napoleon gave them a brief, brief glimmer of hope in that Duchy of Warsaw, Every generation had a revolt or a rebellion against the countries that were occupying the land that is now Poland. And that continued generation in and generation out. It wasn't just like, there was this thing that once was Poland, but it is no longer and never will be. Instead, it was parents telling their kids, like, hey, we're down now. You may not see the day that Poland rises again, but fight so that your children can, or their children can. And that kind of stubborn and persistent spirit continued all the way into, in 1914, what happened? World War I. Now, both sides were promising Poland, like, hey, if you help us, we'll give you a country back. Neither of them were actually going to do it. But there were Polish people fighting on both sides. And then the Americans entered the war. And one of the 14 points that Woodrow Wilson had was that Poland would be recognized once again as a state afterwards. And so finally, from 1793 up until 1914, there was no Poland on the map. For a brief period, there was Duchy of Warsaw, and then that left too. And then finally, Poland is back on the map in 1914. 1917, the, Pol the Russian Revolution takes place. Then in 1918, World War ends. World War I ends. Poland is on the map. And then in 1920, there is what's called the miracle on the Vistula. What was happening in Russia during this time of 1920? The Civil War. Yeah, and then who ended up on top? Stalin. The Bolsheviks. Yeah, the Bolshevik Revolution. And this was going to spread even more than the Ottoman Turks. And then it came to Warsaw. This is the second time in Poland's history that there is this force coming from the east that the Poles think this is going to get everybody behind us unless we stand right here on the front lines. And so once again outnumbered, but stubbornly persistent at the Battle of the Vistula, they end up repelling the Bolshevik forces who go back to Russia. During this time, Poland is rebuilding, rebuilding. And then in 1939, what happens? World War II. World War II. How did it start? Germany invaded Poland. September 1st, 1939. But two weeks later was an even sadder day. Because we always think about, oh, Poland, they got invaded by the Germans. It was so bad. Or I should say by the Nazi party of Germany. Because uh, different Germany than we see today. But, but they're invaded September 1st. What a lot of people at the time didn't know is that Hitler and Stalin hated each other. But they can get together at the same table if it meant sacrificing a third. So they actually had an agreement that they would split Poland down the middle. And so, for two weeks, Poland is trying to fight off the Germans. And they're backed up and backed up and backed up, and they're thinking, the Soviet reinforcements are coming, they're going to come, they're going to help us. And then on September 17th, I believe it was the 17th, from the east, the Russians come in, not for help, but to do their part of the bargain, the bargain deal they gave them Poland. And so they end up getting attacked from both sides, totally crushed, in World War II. During that time, we don't have to dwell on the details, but a fifth of Poland's population ends up killed in battle or in concentration camps. 
and that's just by the Germans. And how many more then afterwards by the Soviets? <coughs> A, Poland had the largest concentration of Jewish peoples because of all these immigrations that we had talked about. Half of the Jewish people that were massacred in the Shoah came from Poland. Three million Jewish Poles. Two million non-Jewish Poles. All killed. And at that time, you would assume, okay, Poland's not going to be able to recover from this. And sure enough, it was difficult because after the war, whose control was Poland under? Yeah, Stalin. The Soviets. And they were not exactly going to use whatever limited resources they had for Poland's betterment. Instead, they would take whatever Poland still had left to give. And that was the situation for a few decades. Until something crazy happened. Do you remember in the 70s, in the late 70s, a man from this obscure country was elected pope? Do you know who that was? Karol Wojtyla of Poland was elected pope. Now you may think, what does some priest becoming a pope have to do with the Iron Curtain and Poland behind it? Well, it had everything to do with it because, once again, this is the thing, you should never give a Polish person hope because then they'll stubbornly cling to it. When they saw that, it gave them hope. When John Paul II came for his first visit to Poland a year or two after he was elected, the communist leaders were visibly shaking as they spoke to him because they realized this might upend a lot of things for us. And sure enough, it took a few decades, but it did. Because one thing, and I'll end on this because I've already gone four minutes over, apologies. <laughs> um, one thing that you see throughout Poland's history is that every culture, in order to survive, needs something in which it can regroup whenever it has suffered a defeat or a persecution or a difficulty. It needs to know who it is as a culture, what it is as a culture. Well, for the Polish people, that was their Catholic faith. That, that whether it was the, the Swedes, who by that time uh, were Protestant, and so there was this like, no, 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 we are not you, uh, we're Catholic. Whether it was uh, the Turks coming with a uh, different worldview, whether it was the Bolsheviks, or now, when it was the communist control. The, the way that Polish people were able to rebel was to be super Catholic. Which is funny, because right now we think of like, oh, rebellious spirit, I'm going to be anything but religious. But if you're in a communist state, it's like, oh, I'm going to do my teenage rebellion. I'm going to read the Bible. <laughs> and that is what Poland did during that time. And then they had this figure like John Paul II, that the Pope in Rome was Polish. And by the late 80s, we had this other heroic priest, or actually mid-80s, called Jerzy Popiełuszko. Now he, uh, we just celebrated two days ago, was the day, the memorial of his death. He was beaten to death by a couple communist thugs, right, of the, the police there. And he is a miniature version of the story of Poland because the powerful ones beat up on him and killed him thinking that is what is going to finally uh, end his message. But if they hadn't, he probably wouldn't be remembered today. He probably would have just been some charismatic priest, great. But because he ended up being a martyr, a sacrifice, that built upon the hope with John Paul II, the sacrifice of Jerzy Popiełuszko became the fall of communism just a few years later. When there were uh, workers' unions that were established, the elections then uh, voted the Communist Party out, and ever since, Poland has been um, a democracy. Does that mean that Poland's struggles are over? No, absolutely not. Now we've got our own demons to face, our own difficulties uh, to um, be able to overcome. But we know, knowing our history, yeah, if we stick to who we are, if we know that and live out of that, yeah, I think we'll be able to, to survive. And so the final note would be that 
Sometimes studying history or reading literature can help us in knowing ourselves. Right? When you read a good book, you can see yourself or other people in your life in the characters, and they can show you truths about yourself that you would never be able to have access to otherwise. Well, studying history can do something similar. Because the very thing that gave Poland its resilience was that it was able to learn what it was about. And resilience is something that over the last year and a half, we've realized we have a desperate need to know personally as well. So my final word would be a word of advice. If you want to be resilient, learn who you are. Know yourself. Because until you know yourself, can regroup in moments of difficulty, until you accept yourself, learn to even love yourself, when other people try to erase you, take you off the map, try to neglect you, abandon you, or even hurt you, you won't be able to put up, put up a fight. But if you know yourself, if you love yourself, then you can stand up to things. And you can even make a gift of yourself to others in love. Of course, I had to end on a sermon, but that's it. <laughs>